Dive into the captivating world of James Cagney, Hollywood's quintessential tough guy with a heart of gold. Beyond the smirking gangster and the tap-dancing patriot lies a story untold, filled with struggles, triumphs, and the relentless pursuit of artistry. When you were a little kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? What did you dream artist. about? You want to be an artist? Oh, yes, you are. I learned how to, to draw very early. Time wears on and you do other things. Join us as we peel back the curtain on the life of a man who was much more than the characters he played on screen. This is the true story of James Cagney, early life and family background. James Francis Cagney Jr. was born on July 17, 1899, in a lively but tough part of Manhattan called the Lower East Side. Growing up in this neighborhood, he learned early on to be tough and determined, qualities he'd carry with him in life and in movies. His dad, James Francis Cagney Sr., worked as a bartender and also boxed on the side, while his mom, Carolyn Elizabeth Nelson, took care of their home. She was a Norwegian homemaker with Irish heritage who created a home rich in culture, but often short on money. People aren't exactly sure where Cagney was born. Some say one place and some say another, but his birth certificate shows he first lived in an apartment at 391 East 8th Street. Cagney was one of seven kids, but sadly two of his siblings died when they were just babies. Even though he was often sick as a little kid, he didn't let that stop him. He grew up to be quite the fighter, thanks to early boxing lessons and living in the busy streets of Manhattan. These experiences made him fast and smart, which would later help him a lot in his acting career. The Cagneys didn't have a lot of money, so they moved around, first to East 79th Street and then to East 96th Street, always looking for a better situation. Cagney was confirmed at St. Francis de Sales Roman Catholic Church, a place that would hold significance for him throughout his life and where his funeral would eventually be held. After finishing high school in 1918 at Stuyvesant High School, Cagney went to Columbia College hoping to study art. He also joined the Student Army Training Corps and started learning German. But when his dad died during the flu pandemic in 1918, he had to quit school to help support his family. To make ends meet, Cagney did all kinds of jobs, from being a junior architect to working at the New York Public Library. Every job taught him to be responsible and work hard for his family. While working at the library, he met Florence James, who saw his potential in acting and encouraged him to pursue it. Cagney also loved to tap dance from a young age, earning him the nickname Cellar Door Cagney because he would dance on slanted cellar doors. Besides dancing, he was really good at defending himself and his brother Harry in fights. He could have been a professional boxer, but his mom said no. Cagney also played baseball and was good enough to dream about the major leagues. However, he eventually moved into movies, which happened by chance. He first got involved in performing by helping out with a Chinese pantomime at Lenox Hill Neighborhood House, where his brother and Florence James worked. One night, when his brother couldn't perform, Cagney stepped in and nailed the performance without a hitch, thanks to his great memory. This was when he started to see himself in the spotlight, marking his shift from working behind the scenes to becoming an actor. Career Beginnings After leaving high school in 1918, Cagney didn't immediately dive into acting. Instead, he found himself working at Wanamaker's department store. It was here, amidst the aisles and counters, that a colleague spotted his dance moves. Impressed, they tipped him off about an audition for a wartime play called Every Sailor, which humorously required the male chorus to dress as women. Despite his reservations and knowing only one dance step, the complicated Peabody, Cagney's audition was a hit. His ability to mimic the other dancer's moves while waiting his turn showed his knack for quick learning. More importantly, Cagney didn't shy away from the role, embracing the transformation with ease. On stage, he was no longer the shy James Cagney, but a performer free from self-consciousness. This experience, however brief, was crucial. Cagney's mother wanted him to pursue education over acting, but the stage had already cast its spell. The $35 a week from every sailor felt like a fortune and cemented his path in entertainment despite taking a job as a brokerage house runner to appease his mother. His quest for more stage work didn't stop, leading him to audition for the musical Pitter Patter, where he secured a chorus part and a $55 weekly paycheck, most of which he sent home. Pitter Patter wasn't just a job, it was where Cagney met Francis Willard Billy Vernon, a fellow performer who would become his wife in 1922. Together, they ventured into vaudeville, forming the duo Vernon and Nye, combining comedy, song, and dance in acts that showcased their chemistry and talent. One of their acts, known for blending humor with impressive dance routines, 
made them a hit on the vaudeville circuit. Despite the cheers, life in vaudeville was not without its challenges. The couple faced the same hardships as many performers of the time, traveling extensively, often performing multiple shows a day, and dealing with the financial instability that came with the territory. Yet, they persevered, their partnership on and off stage growing stronger with each performance. Cagney's Broadway debut came in 1925 with Grand Street Follies, marking a significant transition from the vaudeville stages to the more prestigious world of Broadway. This debut was more than just a step up in the world of theater. It was a confirmation of Cagney's talents and his ability to captivate an audience beyond the vaudeville circuit. His performance in Grand Street Follies caught the eye of critics and audiences alike, setting the stage for greater opportunities. It was his role in Penny Arcade that truly turned heads in Hollywood. In this play, Cagney's portrayal of a streetwise tough captured the essence of his own upbringing and highlighted his ability to bring complex characters to life. His performance was so compelling that it caught the attention of Warner Brothers, who saw in Cagney a star in the making. The transition from Broadway to film was a pivotal moment in Cagney's career. His contract with Warner Brothers was not just a ticket to Hollywood. This contract set the stage for a career in film that would make James Cagney one of the most beloved actors of his time rise to fame and other notable performances. James Cagney burst onto the movie scene in 1930 with Sinner's Holiday, immediately setting himself apart as a new kind of star in Hollywood. This movie, based on the play Penny Arcade, showcased Cagney's natural talent, which caught the eye of Al Jolson. Jolson, seeing something special in Cagney and his co-star Joan Blondell, convinced Warner Brothers to cast them in the film, despite initial skepticism from Jack Warner, the studio head. Warner doubted their potential to draw crowds, favoring other actors instead. But Cagney, playing Harry Delano, brought to life a character that was both tough and tender, laying the groundwork for the kind of roles he would become famous for, the tough guy with a heart. The next year, Cagney's career soared with The Public Enemy, a role that was initially smaller but was soon swapped to make him the lead thanks to his undeniable charm and presence. This film changed the game, offering moviegoers a main character who was deeply flawed, yet fascinating, moving away from the typical hero archetype. Cagney's portrayal of Tom Powers, a small-time criminal, was groundbreaking, showing audiences the complexities of such a character's life with honesty and depth. The success of The Public Enemy not only made Cagney a household name, but also redefined Hollywood's idea of a leading man. Following this triumph, Warner Brothers locked Cagney down with a seven-year contract. However, this deal came with strings attached, allowing the studio to potentially let him go after 40 weeks. Despite this uncertainty, Cagney didn't let it slow him down. He generously shared his earnings with his family, staying humble and grounded despite his rising star. During this time, he took on diverse roles. In the classic Angels with Dirty Faces from 1938, James Cagney steps into the shoes of Rocky Sullivan, creating a landmark moment for both his career and the gangster film genre. Teaming up once again with Pat O'Brien, their on-screen chemistry dives deep into themes of crime, friendship, and the gray areas of morality. This film, alongside Boy Meets Girl, signaled Cagney's return to the tough guy roles that Warner Brothers found profitable. Interestingly, Cagney had wanted to bring Angels with Dirty Faces to life while at Grand National, a smaller studio that couldn't back the project. The climax, where Rocky faces his fate in the electric chair, is brilliantly uncertain. Cagney's choice to leave Rocky's final act of cowardice, or bravery, ambiguous, added complexity to his character, earning him an Academy Award nomination and the New York Film Critics Circle Award for Best Actor. His stance on not using live ammunition during filming proved wise, especially after a close call that could have ended tragically. Yankee Doodle Dandy in 1942 offered Cagney a chance to showcase his dynamic range, stepping into the role of the patriotic George M. Cohan. Lauded by critics, Cagney's performance won him an Academy Award for Best Actor. The timing of the film's production, starting just after the Pearl Harbor attack, infused the project with a sense of patriotic duty that resonated deeply with both those making the film and the audience. Cagney's portrayal was more than just an acting triumph. It was a homage to the American spirit, making Yankee Doodle Dandy a significant piece of wartime cinema. The premiere, doubling as a war bonds fundraiser, was a massive success, highlighting the film's impact on American morale during a critical period. White Heat, 
released in 1949, marked a return for Cagney to the gangster genre, but with a revolutionary twist. As Cody Jarrett, he brought to life a complex, psychotic criminal, moving away from the more straightforward gangsters he'd portrayed earlier. This role, enriched by Cagney's personal experiences and keen observations, showcased his ability to delve into the psychological depth of his characters. The film, featuring the unforgettable line, Made it, Ma, top of the world, solidified Cagney's place in film history. His deliberate portrayal of Jarrett's mental instability introduced a new dimension to the archetype of a gangster, proving Cagney's lasting impact on storytelling in cinema. Love Me or Leave Me, 1955 presented James Cagney with a standout opportunity to dive deep into the complexity of a non-typical character for him, Martin Moe the Gimp Snyder. This film, where Cagney stars opposite Doris Day, showcased a different side of his acting prowess. Playing a character inspired by a real-life gangster, Cagney's performance ventured beyond the realm of his iconic tough-guy roles, exploring the intricate blend of crime and intense emotional drama. Remarkably, this was the first project since the early days of his career, specifically since Smart Money in 1931, where Cagney took on a role without leading billing. His depiction of Snyder's limp is particularly notable for its authenticity. Rather than mimicking a specific person, Cagney developed the limp through observation, adding a realistic layer to his portrayal that didn't go unnoticed. This nuanced performance led to another Academy Award nomination for Best Actor, 17 years following his first nomination, underscoring the depth of his talent. Doris Day, his co-star, lauded Cagney for the realism he brought to their scenes, a sentiment that echoed the early praise from Joan Blondell about Cagney's naturalistic acting style. Moving to the later stage of his career before he stepped away from acting for a while, 1-2-3, 1961, saw Cagney in a vastly different setting, playing a dynamic Coca-Cola executive in a Billy Wilder-directed comedy set during the Cold War. This role demonstrated Cagney's versatility, showing off his skill with both slapstick and snappy dialogue. Despite the film's comedic tone, the production was not without its challenges, including tension with co-star Horst Buchholz, and a particularly demanding filming schedule that ultimately influenced Cagney's decision to retire from acting. Cagney's time on 123 was also notable for his mentoring of Pamela Tiffin, to whom he imparted the essence of truthful performance, a principle that guided his entire career. Despite the challenges faced during filming, including a visit to the Dachau concentration camp that left a profound impact on him, Cagney's work in this film remains a highlight of his late career, capturing the essence of his broad-ranging talent. Cagney's career was also notable for his fierce independence and strong principles, especially evident when he stood his ground during a charity drive led by Douglas Fairbanks Jr., where he insisted on donating on his terms. This refusal to be pushed around earned him the nickname the professional against her among industry peers. Cagney's stubbornness sometimes caused tension, but it also brought him respect for sticking to his values, showcasing the depth of character of the man behind the roles, career challenges. From his first major success in The Public Enemy, 1931, Cagney quickly became synonymous with the tough guy gangster role. However, this pigeonholing by Warner Brothers soon became a source of frustration for Cagney. The studio system of the time was rigid, with actors under contract having little say in the roles they played. Cagney found himself in a cycle of similar roles, yearning for the opportunity to showcase his range as an actor. His desire to break away from the gangster mold and explore a wider range of characters put him at odds with Warner Brothers, which was keen on capitalizing on his tough guy persona. This tension led to a series of conflicts, highlighting Cagney's determination to steer his career according to his artistic vision rather than studio mandates. The situation escalated when Cagney demanded a salary that reflected his contributions to the studio's success, asking for parody with other top stars like Edward G. Robinson and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. Warner Brothers, unwilling to acquiesce to his demands, suspended him, setting the stage for a standoff that showcased Cagney's unwavering resolve. Notably, Cagney proposed to act in three films for free if it meant being released from his contract, a bold move that exemplified his desperation to escape the studio's grip, even considering leaving Hollywood to pursue a completely different career path. It took the intervention of Frank Capra to broker a deal that would end the impasse, resulting in a significantly better contract for Cagney. This new agreement not only increased his salary to about $3,000 a week, but also ensured top billing and limited his workload to no more than four films a year. 
This clause was particularly important to Cagney, who was appalled by the industry's practice of overworking actors, sometimes to the detriment of their health. Cagney's insistence on limiting his film output stemmed from a deep-seated belief in the importance of fairness and the distribution of wealth generated by the movies. He was acutely aware of the exploitative nature of the block booking system employed by studios, which ensured their profits often at the actor's expense. His stance on these issues led him to play a key role in the founding of the Screen Actors Guild, aimed at protecting actors from the overwhelming power wielded by the studios. Upon his return to Warner Brothers, Cagney starred in Hard to Handle 1933 and a slew of other films that allowed him to showcase his versatility, from the dance-filled Footlight Parade to his collaborations with Pat O'Brien in Here Comes the Navy 1934. These films were a departure from his gangster image and demonstrated his wide-ranging talent. However, Cagney's relationship with Warner Brothers was tested again with the release of Ceiling Zero in 1935, where a breach of contract occurred due to O'Brien receiving top billing and Cagney being cast in more than the agreed four films per year. This led Cagney to sue Warner Brothers, a legal battle that highlighted his ongoing struggle for respect and autonomy. During this tumultuous period, Cagney sought refuge in New York, exploring his interest in farming. This time away from the studio system allowed him to regroup and plan his next moves carefully. James Cagney's wars with Warner Brothers were not merely about salary disputes or contract technicalities, they were emblematic of a larger struggle for control, respect, and the freedom to pursue one's artistic vision. Through his challenges and victories against the studio, Cagney not only secured a better position for himself, but also laid the groundwork for future generations of actors to demand and receive fair treatment and creative freedom in Hollywood. Personal Life In 1920, while part of the chorus for the show Pitter Patter, James Cagney met Francis Willard Billy Vernon. Their connection was immediate, leading to their marriage on September 28, 1922. This union was not just a mere partnership, but a shared journey that lasted until Cagney's death in 1986, with Francis passing away in 1994. In 1940, the Cagneys expanded their family by adopting two children, a son, James Francis Cagney III, and later a daughter, Kathleen Casey Cagney. Despite his stardom, Cagney was a devoted father, albeit one who valued privacy. He shielded his family from the public eye, cherishing his personal time away from the glare of publicity. However, not all was serene in the Cagney household. James III became estranged from his father, with the two not speaking for years before Cagney's death. This estrangement added a layer of sorrow to Cagney's later years, compounded by the heartbreak of James III's own untimely death from a heart attack in 1984, two years before Cagney's passing. Similarly, Kathleen also grew distant, further emphasizing the theme of estrangement within the family, leading up to her passing in 2004. Beyond his acting and dancing, Cagney had a profound interest in farming. This passion was ignited by a soil conservation lecture he attended, leading him to establish a farm in Martha's Vineyard during his first hiatus from Warner Brothers. The property, embraced by nature and devoid of paved roads, became a sanctuary for Cagney and his wife Billy. The farm was not just a retreat, but a reflection of Cagney's love for the simpler things in life, a stark contrast to Hollywood's glamour. Cagney's affinity for the land grew, leading him to purchase a 120-acre farm in Stanfordville, New York, in 1955. Named Verney Farm, a blend of his and Billy's names, this endeavor showcased Cagney's commitment to agriculture. He transformed it into a working farm, immersing himself in the daily rigors of farm life. His dedication to farming earned him an honorary degree from Rollins College, a recognition he accepted with humility, showcasing his deep respect for the agricultural community. Apart from farming, Cagney had a lifelong love for horses, particularly Morgans, a breed he raised on his farms. This love affair with horses began in his childhood and continued throughout his life. Cagney's passion for the outdoors extended to the sea. A keen sailor, he owned boats harbored on both coasts of the United States, including the Swift of Ipswich. Despite his love for sailing, Cagney was not immune to seasickness. Cagney's artistic pursuits were not limited to the performing arts. He had a profound love for painting, a hobby he took up later in life under the tutelage of Sergei Bongart. Painting offered Cagney a creative outlet, a way to express himself away from the scrutiny of Hollywood. He painted with the passion of an amateur who found joy in the process rather than the acclaim, often gifting his work but never selling it. 
except once for charity. Final years. In 1961, Cagney made the decision to retire from acting, shifting his focus towards his family and his passion for farm life. He spent the following years away from the Hollywood scene, enjoying the tranquility and simplicity that his farms in Martha's Vineyard and Verney Farms in New York offered. This period was a time of contentment for Cagney, as he embraced the role of a farmer with the same passion he had for acting. Cagney's retirement was punctuated by his aversion to returning to the screen, often recalling the image of Jack L. Warner to quell any temptations. This resolve made it easier for him to turn down significant roles, including an offer to play Alfred Doolittle in My Fair Lady and a part in The Godfather Part II. Despite these rejections, Cagney's influence in Hollywood remained undiminished, and he continued to make rare public appearances, which were celebrated events due to his enduring popularity. During his retirement, Cagney faced health challenges, including a misdiagnosed case of glaucoma that was later correctly identified as diabetes. Under the care of Marge Zimmerman, who took it upon herself to manage his diet and health, Cagney's condition improved significantly. This improvement was evident when he made a rare public appearance at the American Film Institute Life Achievement Award Ceremony in 1974, looking healthier and lighter. In 1981, after a 20-year hiatus from filmmaking, Cagney returned to the silver screen with a small but pivotal role in Ragtime, directed by Milos Forman. This comeback was met with tremendous excitement, and Cagney's performance was a testament to his undiminished talent. Despite his age and health issues, he immersed himself in the role, bringing depth and authenticity to his character. The production of Ragtime was a challenging yet rewarding experience for Cagney, who faced difficulties with sciatica but remained committed to completing the project. Cagney's occasional appearances continued to demonstrate his significant impact on the film industry and his ability to captivate audiences, even after years away from the spotlight. In the early 1980s, Cagney made a memorable appearance alongside his frequent co-star Pat O'Brien on the British chat show Parkinson. The duo also made a surprise appearance at the Queen Mother's Command birthday performance at the London Palladium in 1980, an event that led to a rare standing ovation from the Queen Mother herself, highlighting the profound respect and admiration that Cagney commanded. Cagney's final role came in 1984 with Terrible Joe Moran, a television movie that once again showcased his ability to deliver compelling performances despite his advancing age and health issues. The film was tailored to accommodate Cagney's physical limitations, incorporating his real-life mobility challenges into the story. This role was a fitting end to Cagney's illustrious career, providing him with one last opportunity to demonstrate his skill and passion for acting. Death, Honors and Legacy James Cagney, the quintessential American actor known for his dynamic screen presence, passed away from a heart attack on Easter Sunday, 1986, at his farm in Stanford, New York, when he was 86 years old. The loss of such a towering figure in cinema led to a widespread outpouring of grief and respect from fans and the entertainment industry alike. His funeral mass at St. Francis de Sales Roman Catholic Church in Manhattan saw an assembly of notable personalities, reflecting the deep admiration and affection many held for him. The eulogy, delivered by his close friend and then President Ronald Reagan, touched on Cagney's profound impact both on and off the screen. Distinguished individuals like boxer Floyd Patterson, dancer Mikhail Baryshnikov, actor Ralph Bellamy, and director Milos Forman carried his coffin at the funeral, illustrating the broad spectrum of Cagney's relationships. High-profile attendees, such as Governor Mario M. Cuomo and Mayor Edward I. Koch highlighted the actor's importance. Cagney was laid to rest in a crypt in the Garden Mausoleum at the Cemetery of the Gate of Heaven in Hawthorne, New York, marking the end of an era, but also the beginning of a legacy that would endure. In 1943, he won the Academy Award for Best Actor for his unforgettable role as George M. Cohen in Yankee Doodle Dandy. His portrayal not only showcased his exceptional talent, but also his ability to capture the essence of the American spirit. This performance, among others, solidified his place in Hollywood history. Cagney's contributions to cinema were further recognized in 1960 when he was immortalized with a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, located at 6504 Hollywood Boulevard. This honor is a reflection of his significant impact on the film industry and his status as a cultural icon. The American Film Institute awarded Cagney its Life Achievement Award in 1974, acknowledging his as a pivotal figure in a generation when American film was at its zenith. Charlton Heston, in announcing the award, lauded Cagney as 
that most American of actors, highlighting his universal appeal and significant influence on actors worldwide. Cagney's achievements were also celebrated with the Kennedy Center Honors in 1980 and a Career Achievement Award from the U.S. National Board of Review in 1981, underscoring his contributions to the arts and American culture. In 1984, Ronald Reagan awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom, recognizing his substantial contributions to the country and its cultural heritage. Further cementing his legacy, in 1999, the United States Postal Service issued a 33-cent stamp honoring Cagney. This gesture was not merely an acknowledgement of his cinematic achievements, but also of his place in the collective American consciousness. Cagney's influence extended beyond the silver screen, impacting not only audiences, but also fellow artists and filmmakers. Directors like Stanley Kubrick and actors such as Marlon Brando regarded him highly, with Orson Welles once declaring him maybe the greatest actor to ever appear in front of a camera. His ability to communicate with audiences worldwide underscored his unparalleled talent and charisma. Cagney the Musical, which opened off Broadway in 2015, dramatizes his relationship with Warner Brothers and celebrates his life and career. The musical's run until May 2017 is a testament to Cagney's lasting appeal and the indelible mark he left on American entertainment. James Cagney's departure left a void in the world of cinema, but his legacy endures through his films, the honors bestowed upon him, and the continued celebration of his life and work. Thanks for watching. We'll see you in the next video.